Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. So how to develop this uh, criterion? Uh, in the uniaxial test, note that the maximum shear stress occurs on the planes oriented at 45 degree with respect to applied stress. This fact and the equations are easily verified with the Mohr circle as shown in figure. So this is just to uh, reinforce our understanding, not that anything we are finding it new here. Okay, just to plot these ideas into a Mohr circle and we'll uh, get, you know, uh, see the visual experience of uh, the, the maximum shear stress criteria. Okay, so what is that uh, we are seeing? We are now considering the uniaxial uh, deformation, a tensile deformation, uh, whether it could be a, a cylindrical member or it's a square member. And uh, we are saying that uh, uh, the, the maximum shear stress occurs on the planes oriented 45 degrees. So, so this is the square member. So according to this geometry, this is the plane which we are talking about, which is oriented at 45 degrees. So on this plane, the shear stress is uh, tau prime is sigma 1 by 2, which is nothing but uh, tau naught is equal to sigma 1 by 2. Okay. Um, so, same thing is plotted here. So, since it is a uniaxial tension, so you have only sigma 1, others are 0. And you remember that uh, this is uh, maximum shear. And uh, in the Mohr circle, we always plot 2 alpha, if you recall those concepts. So it is exactly uh, 45 degree. So 2 alpha is uh, 45 degree. So here the 2 alpha is 90. So the maximum shear stress tau is here. And then this is the max, I mean, the principal uh, sigma 1. Okay. So this is very uh, nicely we can uh, represent in a more circle. That's what I'm showing. So the equation for yielding can thus be written in terms of sigma naught as sigma naught by 2 is equal to max times uh, uh, tau 1, tau 2, and um, tau 3. Okay. Uh, or you can rewrite uh, in this form. The effective stress is most conveniently defined in this equation so that it equals the uniaxial strength sigma naught at a point of yielding. That is, so we are interested in relating this into a simple yield strength in a uniaxial uh, tension. So it can be rewritten like this sigma s bar is equal to max times tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 where the subscript S specifies the maximum shear stress criterion. Okay. Similarly, similar to what we have seen in the normal fracture criterion, here also the safety factor against the against yielding is then x equal to sigma naught divided by sigma S bar. It is a subscript. There is a typo here. Sigma S bar. So this is a safety. So, uh, we will now move on to another uh, uh, criterion called octahedral shear stress criterion. Okay. This is again uh, for ductile materials only, similar to uh, Tresca yield criterion. Like I mentioned in the beginning, there are different yield criteriums are proposed, several uh, depending upon the uh, materials and the state of stress and so on. We are looking at uh, some of the important ones and at the same time simple ones which can be related to simple, uh, this criterion can be related to the parameter which you can normally obtain by the simple uniaxial tension test. That's the idea. Okay. See, the other uh, criterion, shear stress yield criterion for ductile material is octahedral shear stress yield criterion. Okay. So, what does it say? Another yield criterion often used for ductile metals is the prediction that yielding occurs when the shear stress on the octahedral planes reaches the critical value tau h is equal to tau h naught at yielding. So now we have to understand what is this octahedral plane right, in a, our crystal system. We will see it in a minute. Where tau h naught is the value of octahedral shear stress T, I mean tau H necessary 
to pass yielding. The resulting octahedral shear stress yield criterion also often called either the one mises or the distortion energy criterion represents an alternative to the maximum shear stress criterion. So this is uh, another way of predicting the yield criterion similar to maximum shear stress criterion or Tresca criterion. So what are this octahedral stresses? The octahedral stresses are a particular set of stress functions which are important in the theory of plasticity. Okay. They are stresses acting on the faces of a 3D octahedron which has the geometric property that the faces of the planes make an equal angles with each of the three principal direction of the stress. So if you assume that in a cube when we define uh, state of stress in a cube and then we looked at uh, all three principal directions, right? So if you recall that a uh, cube uh, describing the stress, then you can imagine this. For such a geometric body, an angle between the normal to one of the faces and the nearest principal axis is 54 degree 44 minute. And a cosine of this angle is 1 by root 3. This is equivalent to 1, 1, 1 plane in an FCC crystal lattice. Take a simple cube, the 1, 1, 1 plane, which is nothing but an octahedral plane. Okay. So that is what is talked about here. A physical justification for such an approach is follows. What is the physical justification to look at the octahedral stresses in an octahedral plane? What is the physical justification? Since the hydrostatic stress sigma h is observed not to affect yielding, it is logical to find the plane where this occurs as a normal stress and then to use the remaining stress tau h as the failure criterion. So what does it say? We have been now saying that the hydrostatic stress is not going to contribute to the yielding. So, in a total uh, stress, so if you recall that we have looked at one particular lecture exclusively, how to separate this hydrostatic component of a stress and a stress deviate, right? So, it, this here exactly we are using that stress deviate. We are, we are, we are talking about a nothing but a stress deviator here, which is very useful now. So, another justification is to note that although yielding is caused by the shear stresses, tau max occurs on only two planes in the material, whereas tau h is never very much smaller and occurs on four planes. Very important. You have to remember, although yielding is caused by shear stresses, tau max occurs only two planes in the material, right? We have two planes, if you recall that uh, uh, image what we have just discussed in the previous slides, where tau h is never very, very much smaller and occurs on four other planes, okay? So tau max is on two planes, but tau h is also occurring other four planes. So totally we have seen six planes, right? So that, that is what we are talking about here. Okay. So they are not very much smaller. So we have to look at those. Hence, on a statistical basis, tau h has the greater chance of finding a crystal planes that are favorably oriented for a slip. And this may overcome its disadvantage of being slightly smaller than tau max. So, the shear stress which is going to cause the slip also depending upon several other factors like orientation of the, uh, you know, crystal with, with respect to axis of loading and so on. We will see the, those things uh, when we look at the, um, I mean, plastic deformation in much more detail. And uh, 
taking this shear stress for a criteria, why we take shear stress for a criterion to predict the yielding is the, this is one of the reason, right. Uh, so the shear stress on an octahedral plane is a tau h is equal to 1 by 3 times square root of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 square plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 square. So that the failure criterion is uh, tau h0 is equal to 1 by 3 times uh, square root of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 whole square plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 whole square at yielding. Okay. As was done for the maximum shear stress criterion, it is useful to express the critical value in terms of yield strength from a tensile tension test or tensile test. Substitution of the uniaxial stress state with the sigma 1 is equal to sigma naught and sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 is equal to 0 into the octahedral shear criterion gives tau h naught is equal to square root by 3 times sigma naught. Okay, so we got now uh, a, an expression for the octahedral shear stress. From this three dimensional geometry of the octahedral planes, it can be shown that the plane on which the uniaxial stress acts is related to octahedral plane by a rotation through an angle alpha of the figure what we have seen here below where alpha is um, yeah cos to the power minus 1 times 1 by square root 3 which is nothing but 54.7 degree okay so this is an angle uh, with which it is uh, oriented with respect to tensile axis So again, we will uh, plug in all these values into the Mohr circle. The same result can also be obtained from Mohr circle by noting that in uniaxial tension, the normal stress on the octahedral plane is, is nothing but sigma 1 by 3. Okay. Locating the point that uh, sacrifices this on Mohr circle leads to a aforementioned values of alpha and tau h0. How do we do that? So this is uh, again, uh, uniaxial tension, this is on cylindrical member, this is a square member, we are looking at uh, alpha is equal to 54.7, that is a, a orientation of this uh, plane with respect to sigma 1 and sigma h is equal to sigma 1 by 3 and tau h is equal to square root uh, 2 divided by 3 times sigma 1, this is what the yield criterion shows. And if you look at the Mohr circle, what is shown here? So this is uh, uniaxial tension. So it is sigma 1 here. And uh, this is 2 alpha. That means uh, it is about uh, 108 something, right? It is 2 times the 54.7 degree. So that is shown here. So this is where the uh, the maximum shear stress will, will lie here. And that is... Uh, if you look at the corresponding sigma 1, it is sigma 1 by 3 and this is the tau max here or tau h. The value of tau h is this value and this is the sigma 1 value. So this is now very uh, easy when you, uh, I mean this more circle concept is comes very handy to visualize uh, the, the maximum stress, normal stress versus uh, shear stress values. So, so this is for the octahedral shear stress criterion. So, the yield criterion in the desired form expressed in terms of uniaxial yield strength is uh, sigma naught is equal to 1 by square root 2 times uh, square root of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square plus uh, sigma 2 minus sigma 3 whole square plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 or square at yielding. Okay. We are interested in to express this criterion in terms of yield, yield strength. That's why we are writing it here. Again, we will now arrive at a safety factor. So, 
we are we are interested in the effective stress for this theory is most conveniently defined so that it equals a uniaxial strength sigma naught at the point of yielding so sigma h bar uh, times this same ex uh, expression here and uh, the subscript h specifies that the effective stress is determined by the octahedral shear stress criterion also the corresponding safety factor x uh, equal to sigma naught divided by sigma h bar so similar to the previous cases this effective stress may also be determined directly for any state of stress without the necessity of first determining the principal stresses yeah so the result is sigma h bar is equal to 1 by square root 2 times sigma x minus sigma y all square plus sigma y minus sigma z whole square and sigma z minus sigma x whole square plus 6 times uh, tau x y square plus tau y z square plus tau z square. So what is this expression? If you recall when we opened up uh, the strain matrix, we, we looked at all the invariants, you know, stress invariants and strain invariants. If you recall the our old derivation if you go back to the our old derivation j1 j2 j3 these are the three invariants we derived if you look at the j2 okay so that it is nothing this expression is nothing but the j2 invariant right so instead of doing this we can also can determine this uh, sigma h bar by directly substituting into this equation uh, that is why this statement is given. This effective stress may also be determined directly for any state of stress using this expression. So, just to give an uh, idea, you know, why we looked at the the, the, the earlier uh, you know, expressions and how it is useful here now to predict the yield criteria. That is why it is shown here. Okay, now come to the, uh, the most... Uh, um, important uh, idea. We are now created the surfaces, the yield surfaces or yield, uh, yeah, or fracture surfaces. Here it is yield surfaces for uh, uh, biaxial loading. This is a Trusca yield criterion and which shows that uh, four quadrants, one, two, three, four, and then you have uh, sigma one and sigma two. And uh, the boundary uh, demarcates uh, no yielding and then yielding. Okay. Stress combinations lying within the solid lines do not result in plastic flow. Those without it do. So that means uh, within this solid line, the combination of stresses sigma 1 and sigma 2 it will not cause yielding. As per the Tresca A criterion. Okay. In quadrants 1 and 3, yielding occurs when the magnitude of the algebraically largest in, in, uh, in 1 and smallest in 3 right, exceeds sigma y, the tensile yield strength. Okay, so this is quite obvious from looking at this. Okay. In quadrant 2, on the other hand, sigma 2 is greater than 0 and sigma 1 is, is less than 0 and sigma 3 is equal to 0. Yielding is defined by sigma max, that is nothing but sigma 2 minus sigma minimum, that is sigma 1 is equal to yield strength. So, sigma max minus sigma minimum is equal to yield strength. And this results in the 45 degree line defining the yielding. Okay, so this is what it is shown here, 45 degree line here. Okay. And in the yield criterion is similar in quadrant 4, uh, except that uh, the, it is just reversed here. So sigma 1 is uh, greater than 0 and sigma 2 is less than 0 and sigma 3 is 0. Okay, so that is what is shown here. So what is this image now shows? It is showing the same uh, yield criterion here, but also it plotted 
the one Mises yield criterion, which is uh, a solid line again, this over this. This is again the one Mises yield condition for biaxial loading is shown by the solid line. What you can see is uh, the Tresca is the more conservative criterion and uh, the two criteria are equivalent only for uniaxial that is sigma 1 or sigma 2 is greater than 0 with uh, sigma 2 and sigma 1 equal to sigma 3 is equal to 0 and uh, balanced biaxial sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 and sigma 3 is equal to 0 loading. So only it is uniaxial and balanced biaxial loading these two criterion are equivalent. Otherwise, the, the one Mises yield criterion shows slight deviation when you move away from the, the principal axis, right? So, this particular image which shows the experimental uh, uh, findings. You can see that uh, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, these are the um, experimental data obtained for steel, copper and nickel and then you see that uh, most of the data points lies just close to one Mises criterion but not very uh, different from Tresca but then it is close to one Mises criterion for a biaxial loading. Okay, okay now uh, uh, we have to turn our attention to uh, yield criteria for other than crystalline materials or semi-crystalline materials called polymers, right? So far, all this yield criterion uh, represented the failures of or yielding of crystalline material or ductile materials or even a brittle materials where we, we looked at uh, the maximum uh, normal principal stress or fracture stress criteria, right? So those things, those yield criteria will not work for polymers or semi-crystalline or amorphous material. So we look at it. What is the, what is the change the required to predict the yield criteria for polymers? So it has been seen that polymers typically have very different yield behavior in tension and in compression and this can be attributed to hydrostatic pressure effects. So if you recall when we looked at the elastic properties in the earlier lectures, we have clearly shown how this uh, you know semi-crystalline materials are you know long chain molecular materials how they behave in tension as well as compression very nice illustration we had. We had also discussion about how this uh, compression uh, behavior is entirely different from the tensile behavior when it comes to deformation of poly, I mean long chain molecular uh, materials are namely polymers, right? So that is uh, exactly uh, is brought here. So the hydrostatic pressure effects okay has to be taken into account first it is seen that yield is uh, yield in tension occurs at lower true stress than the yield in compression this also we have seen okay the slope of the stress strain curve even in elastic region uh, in tension and compression for this long molecular chain molecular materials are they are not same they are very different okay since we have already seen this i am just uh, going little fast so that is the purpose we have spent some time on the fundamentals, right? So you can easily recollect. And even if you have doubts, you can go back to those sections and then read them, then it will be easy. As positive pressure, that is compressive stress is exerted on this low stiffness material, the chains are pressed together and the chain mobility is diminished. Okay. Conversely, under the negative pressure, that is a tension stress, the average spacing between the chains in the direction particularly particular or uh, sorry uh, direction perpendicular to the principal normal stress is increased and the chain mobility is enhanced this point also we have already seen 
So in the light of the significant influence of pressure on polymer yielding, several pressure dependent yield criteria have been proposed and compared to the experimental results. So one thing is very clear. We are going to look at the yield criterion, almost similar kind, but the one parameter is which is very new here is the pressure effect. Okay. So the more coulomb model which is going to describe this and the modified trust criteria so are the based on the existence of a critical shear stress just like the classical trust criteria we are going to use the same uh, criterion like uh, what we have seen for uh, you know uh, ductile materials we will simply use the pressure effect on them and which is called more coulomb model In the more coulomb model, the pressure influence is described as a simple normal stress imposed on the plane of sliding with a frictional term added to couple the normal stress to the critical shear stress. Very important. Okay. So this model brings the pressure influence. Um, where the normal stress is imposed on a plane of sliding. So we are talking about now molecular uh, chain which are sliding. It is sliding of this molecular chain with the frictional term added to couple the normal stress to the critical shear stress. So it takes the form tau mc. mc is a more coulomb model is equal to tau c critical stress critical shear stress minus mu mc sigma n where mu mc is the critical shear stress in the presence of normal stress and tau c is the critical shear stress in the absence of normal stress mu mc is the coefficient of friction and sigma n is the normal stress negative for compression as written So this is a significant departure from the case of metals and ceramics for which the normal stress plays no role in determining the yield. So very important idea, okay, where we are bringing a normal stress into a yield criterion, okay, uh, especially a Tresca yield criterion. So what is that uh, we have seen so far in Tresca? So this is what this plot shows clearly. This is a uh, normal Tresca yield threshold is shown in a, a dotted line here, a thick dotted line. And this is uh, tau and this is uh, sigma n. And we have now put a, another slanting line, which is uh, having an angle with respect to this horizontal line phi. And that we call it as pressure modified Tresca. Okay. So the more coulomb criterion is also sometimes written as tau mc is equal to tau c minus tan phi times sigma n, where phi is the angle that the yield surface makes with the classical failure surface as shown in the figure. Okay. Note that the more coulomb criterion does not distinguish between yielding under the uniaxial or multi-axial multi loading. Okay, this is one limitation. The pressure modified Tresca criterion, however, treats the pressure phenomenon in three dimensions, but it has the similar form. So, tau t is equal to tau t naught plus mu t times p, which is uh, also written as half times sigma max minus sigma minimum is equal to tau t naught plus mu t times p. Okay where mu t is the pressure coefficient and p is the mean hydrostatic pressure. That is, p is equal to 1 by 3, sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3. So that p is positive for hydrostatic compression. So what you now see is here, uh, we are using the similar Tresca criterion where the pressure effect is very nicely brought in 
to accommodate the uh, polymeric or long chain molecular behavior under compression. Okay. The pressure modified version of von Mises criterion, yield criterion depends upon the critical distortion energy just like the classical version and takes essentially the same overall form as the modified heating star which is tau Vm is equal to tau oct 0 plus mu Vm times P. So this is von Mises yield criterion. So tau Vm is the critical octahedral shear stress for yielding as a function of pressure mu vm is the pressure coefficient and p is the mean pressure. Here tau octa naught is the critical octahedral shear stress determined in the absence of hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Note that for uniaxial loading tau octahedral is equal to square root of 2 by 3 times mod sigma where p is equal to minus sigma by 3. All the pressure modified yield criteria assume a linear dependence on the pressure. This is one thing we have to note. It has been found that this works well at low pressures, that is 100 MPa, but may not be suitable for very high hydrostatic pressures. So for that, some other empirical models have to be looked at. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, stop here. We will uh, continue our lectures in the next class.